Oh, there you are. Where were you last week? So, uh, wait till you see what Mark's got me doing now. <laughs> Coming back on the Left air. Left time on Graveyard Con. My name is on that sign out. Your name's not on it. We don't have a sign. Okay. Well, if I had a sign, it would be on there. Well, It'd be so Mark Foreman's Graveyard Cars because okay. I earned it. So we're running a Krager wheel on her car, but it's not exactly this. And I can't remember the name of it, but we just ordered it and they're supposed to be in in about a week. I think this is the car I want. I knew it when I seen it. That's not how that works. It this station will remain on the air. On this episode. We've got 45 days to completely restore a 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner. What are we doing, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> I sure feel all the pressure coming down on my neck because we're at the very beginning of this process and everybody's hungry to get this car. I don't know how we're even going to be able to do this. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. I'm a liar and a bat now. His daughter, Alyssa Rose. <laughs> Why would you do that? His painter, Will Scott. Got one job. And his cousin, Dougie. Oh, hi, Welcome back to Graveyard Cars. There's good things and bad things about being the owner. In this particular case, as the owner of Graveyard Cars, the buck stops on my desk. Never been more true than right now. There's a time for fun and for games and for laughter. And then there's a time just to get serious with stuff, so. I've got to go in and rally up the troops as we speak. Oh, no. God, he's so <laughs> Rocky. Oh, no. This ain't for Rocky. No more That's for Rocky the original. Right? Yeah. Gentlemen, ladies. George, we've got a situation going on here. We have a urgent situation that had just come up. I made a promise to have a car done by a certain date for a gentleman named Mark. This guy is the salt of the earth. I'm Mark Martinez. I founded and started Stiletto back in the day. I was able to take an idea and change the way that people looked at hammers in the in the framing industry or in general construction industry. This is a super guy. He's a self-made guy. He's in the tool business, titanium tool business, but nobody handed him anything. He sweat for it. And I had lost my brother a few years back, and it was just like losing a big piece of your life. I was digging through some old things and remembering. I started looking back at some old pictures, and I ran across my first car being a 1970 Roadrunner. And that car started becoming something that, especially with my brother passing, you know, all of a sudden it became a real big piece of me. Cut. Do you need a minute? Okay. And then one day uh, I turned the TV on and I catch this crazy show called Graveyard Cars. And it's about Mopar. So I start watching it and I'm going, wow, this is, this is really interesting. I looked at it and said, you know, I wonder how I can get a hold of this guy to talk to him about building me a car. I've got a project right now that's very important that we meet the deadline on. All of them are, but this one may be even more so because I've kind of made a mistake along the way. Not anybody's fault, but my own. So Mark and I, we struck a deal and uh, he said he'd have it ready in 2020. I misread the contract. I did this a year ago. I didn't pay any attention to it. And instead of it needing to be done in January of 2021, I needed to have this 1970 Roadrunner done in time for the 2020 trade show down in Las Vegas for tools. You must need something. We have a vehicle that was supposed to be done by the 15th of next month. What that means is we've got 45 days to completely restore a 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner. This car is getting a 392 Hemi, a six-speed Silver Sport transmission, a Dana 60 <laughs> rear axle, it's EW1. Oh, I decided not to bring it back to its absolute original state of what I drove off the showroom floor. I knew that I needed a car that could be worked on any place that I'm at. And the only way you're gonna do that is to put a modern drivetrain in it. So what I ended up deciding is to get a Crate 392 Hemi with a six speed manual transmission with the old pistol grip. It's gonna be a brand new car underneath 
but it's going to be exactly like the car that I drove off the showroom. 45 days basically is how long we have to completely restore a car. The good news is I was <sighs> locating a car, acquiring it, and preparing it for dip. So here's where we're at. Car needs complete restoration, so first thing we gotta do, of course, is get it disassembled, get it off to the dipper, get it back, figure out what panels need to be replaced. Does that still on. have like a 90-day wait time? Not too bad. I already got a 392 Hemi from Mopar Performance set in here. I already have the Silver Sport transmission set in here, so those are good things. This is a really solid car. Mark was able to find me a 1970 Roadrunner that was a one owner, and it was beat up a little bit, but it was all original. When he showed me that car, I was blown away. It was gorgeous, but more important than that, it comes with the original key the car came with. He has the owner's manual and all the things that it, all the booklets the dealer gives you in the plastic bag that it came from, from the factory in the glove box. So I, you can't get any more nostalgic than that. The only downside to doing it in 45 days is we have to do this kind of like in addition to what we normally do. So what? point is we got to do this in the evenings and on the weekends because we can't interfere. I know we cannot interfere with the customer stuff that's already being done. That's been waiting for years. Well, you can shake your head, but maybe you should have put the quarter on right the first time. You can shake yours, but you know, the third paint I job wasn't even been shaking my head. I think that the most challenging part of this entire build is going to be the fact that my team isn't going to be able to go home like they normally do. We have to work weekends and evenings to get the car done because we can't compromise the other cars that are in the queue getting done right now. We have promises and commitments on them too. So this is on me, this is my fault. Now, I don't mind paying the overtime, I don't mind paying what it takes to get it done, but they're going to have to share that yoke with me. Eight to five customer cars that have been waiting. After that, three hours a night per person, overtime, call your family, tell them you won't be home. And we'll get this thing knocked out because this is what we do. This is why we're the best of the best. This is why we're the elite. This is why we're the ones that people put up in their garage and say, that's who I want to be Is it a real like. 45 days? It's or a real is 45 it, is days. It just you have no land. In 45 days, the car actually has to be at his show in Las Vegas. It's the end of Rocky, the original. Oh, God. We're getting off topic. <laughs> good we were Rocky's the first car in like 30 beat. seconds. We were good. Apollo Creed stinging, floating like a butterfly, all that Okay, stuff. so we should probably get started, and I guess. Beat. You He's got the tired. shirt on. We get it. His eye yeah. is swollen Please. because Rocky liked to block the punches with his I face. Don't know. It was an interesting strategy. <laughs> I'd never done that myself. Not good. His no, eyes. I don't like the sounds of this at all. I think we can see so we could give I'm gonna go Paul yeah. a couple of warm-ups. I'll just put the, the movie on tonight. That, Watch it if I want to. He had to get cut. See it. Right? Yeah. He had to work three hours tonight. He had to get cut. So yeah. what's Rocky say to Mickey? Cut me. Cut. I don't want to do it, kid. I don't want to do it. You got to cut the can of food. I don't want to do it. There's a tremendous amount of emotion that goes into a project this, like this if emotion is what drove you to do it. There's a big word that we use in our trade and in my production of my products, and that is game changer. And uh, it's a game changer. It's a game changer. I, I think I will look through life through this car. Granted, this is an incredibly short timeline, even, even shorter than the ones we've done for SEMA in the past especially last year with Christine. This is a 70 Roadrunner. I can do these cars in my sleep. Doing a build like this under such a time crunch is just, I don't know how we're even gonna be able to do this. There are so many parts to these cars, it's incredible to keep track of them all. I don't know if we're gonna be able to make this deadline or not. So one of the nice things about the way we have the shop set up for an assembly line is different departments. So while we are working on a rear end over here, body work over here, mud over here, paint over here, Justin can start on the sub-assemblies for our 70 Roadrunner, right? As soon as that clock hits five o'clock, he can bring in the steering column, the seats, tear down all the sub-assemblies, the heater box. He can have all those pieces restored and ready to go in the car when it comes back over from paint. So that's what he's gonna be working on. So to take off the steering wheel from the 1970 Roadrunner steering column, you just use a pulley remover tool. You know, you slide the piece in there and it helps pull it off because they're kind of pressed on there. You can't really just yank it off. So one of the steps that I take after, you know, removing the steering wheel, the four bolts on the bottom side of the steering column, just take off the mounting bracket, get that thing ready for sandblasting and paint. So this car was actually a column shift before and it was getting converted over into a floor shift. So I was able to go upstairs and get some of Tony's steering column collars and I was able to actually convert that over to a floor shift steering column. 
Yes, this isn't a numbers matching car. We do like to keep things original to what the car was. We didn't have any problems switching this over from a column shift to a floor shift. The majority of the steering columns can actually get reused. Sometimes the plastic shrinks, cracks, but the customer really likes that steering wheel. It's sentimental to them. But most of the time, all the stuff in these steering columns, that we can reuse them. So a lot of times with these cars, the actual ignition switch, that positive main lead wire that powers that all that, the connector on it is usually burnt up. Sometimes they're not that bad, but in this case, this one was pretty bad. I was able to actually use all the same ignition wires. Some of the ends were good. I snipped one of the ends and then resoldered a new piece on there, pressed a new clip on there, and I was actually able to use the same one. When I tear these things apart, I keep them really organized on the table and nobody touches the table. And then I, I'll take all this stuff out if it needs to be sandblasted, repainted, recoated, and then I'll give some of the stuff to Will, the steering column collars, the uh, steering column tubes. I'll take those over to Will and he can actually get that suede finish painted on there. and lift that bad boy off there, ladies. All right. Boy. Okay, you wanna go back to your guys' this way, maybe? One of the people I'm calling in to help on this 70 Roadrunner is Ron Jenkins from Magnum Force. We've become friends over the years. I have him on speed dial for when I really gotta get something done. Nice. Yeah. Why, Doug? Why, of all the things in the world, why? Look what I gotta deal with. So we've partnered up with Mark a few times in the past. We've done some pretty damn cool cars over the years. And I'm back again. Mark made the phone call. He knows he can rely on me. I'll be here in a heartbeat. Well, the moral of the story is that with Amy, you're well armed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do. The good news is I'm innocent. All right, so we're putting the TTI header and exhaust system on. We have some conversions that you make that need to be on there. So we got to get it up in the air, swap out the oil pan and the sump. Yep, yep. We got to take that clutch off because Silver Sport supplied us with the transmission and clutch package. So we got to get this thing ready so we can put it on your suspension. Right, yeah, we'll get it get it inverted, get the pan off, get the modification done for the starter clearance. That's always good to get it okay. while everything's fresh. And okay. uh, and yeah, we'll get it sitting on top of the K-member and good to go. I can build the OEM cars all day long and I'm fast at it and I'm good at it and I know what to do. But when it comes to the aftermarket performance stuff, he's so much better at it and he builds so many of the parts that we're gonna be putting on like the Magnum Force suspension and stuff like that. This is Ron's wheelhouse. I'm gonna let Ron be the, the captain of this ship, the skipper. Uh, I guess I'll be his first mate, Gilligan. Beautiful, love it. It's a nice pallets they send these out in. Yeah. Okay, I think they ship these dry, so there shouldn't be any oil in it. And then we gotta do the relocator, right? Yeah, what we've been doing is we've been taking the clutch off, putting it on an engine stand, and we're flipping it over. What would you like to do? You're the master technician. Oh, I don't and know. I love this. this. My favorite part. Look at that power steering. Reservoir and pump. So is this is this higher volume in, than the factory one, or is it pretty much the same as the factory one? Do you know? Volume wise, it's it's a pressure issue. It's the here. pressure. Okay. Yeah. How do you get that in there on that that logo? Uh, laser. That's so yeah. cool. There's so much. Boy, that's just a nice looking setup. And you've got your lady is sending us a pulley. Yeah. So we'll have a pulley that matches the serpentine system on the motor. And Ronnie makes these cool motor mounts that go on the 392s and the Hell Crate. I was asking him yesterday. How he welds so nice. I can't do this. I, th but this is a MIG weld. It's not a TIG weld. And it, it looks just like a TIG. It's so beautiful. Look at those. Looks like rolls of quarters laid on end. Just gorgeous. That's good quality <laughs> stuff. Good stuff. That's why we call it Ron Meister. <laughs> okay, so right now they're going to take the oil pan off and the clutch, because we don't use that clutch. That clutch won't work with the Silver Sport transmission, so they provided us with one. Good day today. I am so happy to be working with Ron again on this build because Ron has been so helpful to us in helping navigate us through his suspension and the buildup of the cars that we're doing. Well, to try it, if it breaks, I'm gonna let Ron weld it. I like All the sound right. of that. Got it? Okay. Got it. You're hired. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we got the old bearing out. 
now we'll have to replace it with the silver sport bearing that works with their transmission we don't have to do that this minute we have other conversion things the point of all of this is i want you to see how easy the conversions are if you have the right parts and you just take your time and do it right yeah. okay great yep. all right go ahead and get that on there. you want this to drop down some yeah yeah please so we're just bolting the engine stand up into place you use the original mounting holes for the bell housing for that you can see here, that's what Doug's doing. He's coming through this lower boss right here, upper boss right up there. I like that they're hemi-orange. I know. That's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. I know. <laughs> it's a nice throwback. I'm going to get out of there so I can go over and start working in the other sections of the shop. I need to get down to Will's area and go over a bunch of things with him and some of the other body men. Got to get a little dirty now. Georgie, where's the Willie? Little Willie, Willie, walk. There he is. How you doing this morning, buddy? Yeah, well, well, look at what we have going on in here. <laughs> Getting ready to shoot her, huh? Nope. Uh, covering up a little crime there. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, covering a little crime up. Do a little primer, a little bacon. That's what we call committing a crime and hiding it quickly. Very nice. <laughs> Annie, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Annie? Annie, can you hear me? You're a smooth criminal, man. Uh, 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 uh. And this is where I, okay, I'm doing my good job. And I see he starts rotating around like this, but his shoes are glued to the ground so he can do it better than I can. Annie, can you hear me? Can you hear me? And I slept down like this. Uh, 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 uh. You've been primed by, you've been primed by. That's a criminal. Uh, 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 uh. And then just do the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got it. You've been primed. I got it the first time. Smooth criminal, huh, huh, huh. Yeah, I, I got it. The people at home got it. Michael Jackson, smooth criminal. Yeah, we got it. Annie, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Annie? So why wouldn't he be singing in his normal voice? Hee-hee. Annie, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Shambo. Then he kisses him and grabs his crotch and kicks his leg around a couple times. Did you really grab your crotch? Yeah. Let's do. It's, it's kind of funny. Yeah. No, I'm saying it's just yeah, no, it's something sexual. different. I didn't think. Yeah, it's educational. I, I never said it was. Need a hand? Well, don't think so. Boy, that makes it easy. It does. does. So this is a small block engine. It's not like the big blocks that we always have to work on. And so in some ways, these are a little bit easier to work on. All the plug and play features that we're getting on these things really make it kind of fun because things really do just fit into place. <laughs> I'm not complaining. Yeah, no complaints there. Nice. We've done these modifications quite a few times over the years, as you can imagine, and we've got things pretty well underway and it's looking good. We've been reusing the gasket. It's integrated with the windage tray. So here's the sump, windage tray. And we're gonna take this off, and we're gonna put that right there. But it passes right through where the stud is, so we have to take the stud out and relocate it. So, 85. That's pretty good. Man, that's a little tiny bolt for 85, isn't it? I know. It? <laughs> Wish me luck, know, okay? Wish me luck. Keep those fingers in check. Yeah. <laughs> Get it. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Got lucky. Cool. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna come in right there. Drop our little windage That's tray on there. In there. Sump. Yeah. And we're gonna come in like so. Okay. Beautiful. Ta-da. 1970 represented the peak of the muscle car wars. Everybody wanted in that ring. Everybody. Even AMC had the Rebel machine. Chrysler decided they'd get involved. So they partnered with the legendary shifter company, Hearst, and came up with the 300H. True or false? The 1970 Chrysler 300H is actually shorter bumper tip to bumper tip than the 1969 Dodge Charger. You think you know the answer to that one? Stay tuned after the break. We'll find out together. All 
right, my ghoulish friends, how did we do on that one? The question was, is the 1969 Chrysler 300H actually shorter, bumper to bumper, than a 1969 Dodge Charger? If you said false, you'd be absolutely right. If you said true, you're crazy. <laughs> this is built on a C-body platform. It's actually one of the largest muscle cars of any manufacturer to be built. Had a fiberglass hood, a fiberglass deck lid. They only built 501 of these cars. The answer to the measurement is a 1970 Chrysler Hearst 300. Bumper tip to bumper tip is 220.5 inches, while the nimble 1969 Dodge Charger, same measurement, is 204.5. Okay, so we're gonna mount up some of these wheels and tires for Tony and Cindy's car. Yeah, these five spoke wheels, they do take me back. So, uh, yeah, these wheels are a lot like what we had back in the day. Gregor's are a really pretty wheel. I'm really excited about these right here, though. So. so let's see. Can you mount these up? They go on pretty easy on the first side, the back side. Just pops right on there. See how this one goes on. Nice, just like that. Okay. A little air. Look at that. Well, I heard Mark and you have been working on going down memory lane yourself. Want to tell us a little bit about 14th Street? So yeah, this has been really fun, what Mark's had me doing lately, you know. We've, we've really gone back in time. He loves to go back to our old neighborhood where he grew up, where I grew up. Doug and I have so much history together. You know, we grew up together. On the streets of 14th Street, we learned how to work on cars, but we learned how to work on cars because we learned how to work on a roller skate. Then we learned how, after a roller skate, how to make a small engine run, then how to make a motorcycle run. We learned how things make sense mechanically. Yeah, you know, we used to go to the library and we could check out movies and watch the old horror films, you know, Dracula, you know, so uh, it's been a lot of fun going, going back through all this stuff again. You know, the mini bikes and whatnot. You know, he's even had me building a mini bike lately. It's like, what are we doing, Mark? <laughs> There's mechanical skills that we use every day at home around the house that are basic mechanical skills that we learned on automobiles, but we use them at the house. And so another little idea I had, the ability to work with Doug in another project, I don't know, it might be just a YouTube channel or something, I don't know what it's gonna be, but 14th Street Wheels, where you're gonna be able to tune in with your family and learn about the kind of little skill sets that you might take for granted, but they might lie in you in your child. Your child may be a great mechanic, but doesn't know it because he hasn't been exposed to it. That's what we're hoping to do with 14th Street. They mounted really good, went together real smooth, and uh, center caps went on perfectly. So uh, I am really excited to get these put on Tony's car. Okay, so we got our Roadrunner back from the dipper. We have everything metal dipped here so it removes any bit of rust. It's anything that's in our way from us being able to do our body work on it. One of the things that we run into most frequently in restoring a car are the hidden sins that are underneath the paint. Does it have a lot of rot, a lot of rust? Does it have panels that need to be replaced that sure look good, but they were filled with Bondo? Then what about it being square and true? That's where I get out my tram gauge. The tram gauge is just a bar that's adjustable, that has a good memory because you lock it down. In the case of this car, it lined up better than I've had any cars do in all of my years. I just got done installing the trunk floor. There's a number of things that can go wrong when you're gonna put a trunk floor in. I could have it a little bit too far forward, a little too far back, could be a little too far to the left, a little too far to the right. It went really smooth. I mean, I couldn't ask for an easier panel to go in. 
the front of the floor pan was a little bit rotted. We were able to do patches instead of have to install the whole entire floor, which would have took a lot more time. With this car being so clean, have to put the trunk floor in and the front floor section in, it makes it so much easier because it's nice and square. You pop out the old piece and you just slide the new piece in. I mean, yeah, I've got to do a little bit of plug welding here, a little bit of maintenance here, you know, to the panels that I had a room panel from. But other than that, it's really easy, really simple. If this trunk gutter didn't have the original numbers, I wouldn't even worry about patching it. I would just cut it out, put a new one in. But because it has the original numbers, it's highly important just to patch it up, get it back to as strong as it once was. It turned out really good and I'm happy the way it went in. Even as clean as this car is, I sure feel all the pressure coming down on my neck because we're at the very beginning of this process and everybody's hungry to get this car. So I'm trying to go as fast as I possibly can and make sure that I don't make a mistake. So making sure that frame rail is right where it needs to be is so important. I mean, that lines up your whole entire front cowl, that lines up your fenders. I mean, it all just kind of builds up to something. And the front frame rail, that holds your motor in place. I mean, if it takes a shot in the front, that's what stops a good percentage of that shot of the other car coming at you. I mean, there's so many different things that it does. I mean, it holds the body up, you're hooking the wheels up to it. I mean, so that frame rail has got to be on the money. When you heat up the metal, it makes the metal softer so you can make it do what you want. So I moved it right back in to where it should have been in space and then cooled it down so it's nice and hard. All in all on this car, there really wasn't a ton of body work to be done. It's such a clean car and it's such a nice feeling to have a car come into my area that is only there for a week. That is such a great feeling to be able to just turn a car in and out as quick as I got it. A year ago, I had a fella call me up and say that he had seen the episode of Graveyard Cars where I introduced Graveyard Motors, Graveyard Dreams, which is where you could call up and describe a car exactly the way you want it, and I could build it for you. So like Jim DeLucci's little 72 Duster, we built that way. Uh, Mr. West's 1969 GTX, we built that way. The car he was looking for was a 1971 Hemi Cuda four-speed car. Don't have any of those. Didn't build very many. I don't have any. Uh, and he knew that. He was saying, well, what would it take to build a tribute to that car? And that's what brings us out here today. The car that you see next to me is what's left of a real live 1971 Plymouth Barracuda 318 automatic. It's hard to find a real 1971 Plymouth Barracuda donor car that somebody hasn't already built or there's nothing left of. There are rusty holes out there, which is pretty much what this is now, except that when I bought this car, it was complete. Yes, it was rusty, but it was very, very complete. Has the original dash VIN, had the original door VIN label, uh, even had a fender tag, even though it's a 318. I knew it was rusty. I didn't quite think it was this rusty. So what's left of the 71 Barracuda that's on this dolly right now, we're not gonna use much, if any. You can see that it's in bad shape. Now the upper tie bar actually, in this case, is gonna be reused on our car. The reason why is it has the VIN number in it, the last eight characters of the vehicle identification number. So we'll transfer this onto the new parts. But if you look right there, you'll see the last eight characters of the vehicle identification number. So that's the only number this poor old thing's gonna retain when we're all done, but that's okay. We're building a tribute car. Pretty much after that, aprons, shock towers, frame rails, firewalls gone, it was rusted. The main floor, rusted, gone, folded over into pieces. Nothing left. We'll probably reuse the automatic console brackets that you see here. We'll be able to reuse those pieces. It may be at the end of the day, that's all we use, that and the upper tie bar. But from front to back, it's a rotten mess. The piece that makes it the car is our used roof section. The used roof section is in excellent condition. It's already been taken off, cut, trimmed, dissected, epoxy coated, and really in nice shape. And so we have it ready to go on when we get to that point. The thing is, is to get to that point, we have a lot of parts to replace. So we're getting ready to start a very, very big project at Graveyard Cars. My name is Jeff Kaufman. I work with Silver Sport Transmissions. We're a Tremec Elite distributor. Uh, I've been selling Tremecs for 12 years myself. Um, so this is our, I guess our fourth year partnering with Mark on some builds. So we started off with the Cuda, uh, then we went to the Hellbird, uh, Christine, and now we're doing this Roadrunner. So it's a pretty cool deal. We ran into Mark at SEMA, and uh, we talked about this Roadrunner coming up. 
I told him I'd like to be part of the project. So uh, here I am out here helping, helping with the install. To the engine, you'll start with a pilot bearing. Pilot bearing goes in the crank. You then bolt up the flywheel. Uh, when you bolt the flywheel up, you typically want to leave one or two bolts out uh, so you can get the magnetic base dial indicator in there to check the bell housing runout. So once you check the runout, you can finish installing the flywheel, torque everything down properly, move on to the pressure plate. Uh, it's very important when you install the pressure plate to tighten the bolts a little bit of time in a circular pattern. You, you want to gradually pull the pressure plate down to the flywheel, not all at once. You don't want to tighten each bolt all the way, all at once, then move to the next. Then you move to your bell housing, uh, transmission, uh, make sure your hydraulic bearing is in place, check your hydro uh, hydraulic bearing spacing. So once you have the hydraulic bearing spacing and the runout done, everything else just kind of bolts together. One of the things about this kit in general are these end caps. So to do the six speed in, in the B body and E body, you do have to cut the torsion bar cross member. When you do that, it leaves the channel open and you also lose the inner cross member bolt positions. So these caps, what these caps do, once you cut that, these will weld in place to cap that off. And then you have these supports for the, uh, the inner bolt positions. These allow you to tighten up the cross member bolts on that channel and not crush the channel. This is a small piece but it's very important to have that not everybody's going to have in the package. So I am down here with Doug in our engine room, and we're getting ready to build out our eight and three quarter Dana Rand for Malberg 71 Cuda. I'm excited because I get to take the reins on this one and show Doug what I've learned working with him. It's a nine and three quarter Dana. That's okay. So this is the Burn Phoenix car. You know, that was a really rough car when it came in. All we have to do is put it together now. Okay, so I think we start out with our metal retainer, right? Metal gasket. Sorry. Yes, we do. Sorry, I cut in on you. What is the difference between a retainer and a gasket? Retainer holds your teeth in place. No, a retainer, never mind, Doug, it's okay. Okay, and then we want the ridge facing out. Uh-huh. One of the things that I've really enjoyed watching is Alyssa's growth here at Graveyard Cars and her desire to be involved. I just get so excited knowing that she may very well be able to run this place someday. And to be able to work with my cousin, Doug, who I love and respect, and I know he's such a better teacher than I am. <laughs> he's patient, he's calm, he doesn't need to go for the joke or sarcasm or insult people, which I don't know why I do it, it's a sickness. So this hole right here, is for the brake cable for the parking brake. Okay. It has to be on the front. On the... This is the front. It's the driver's side, right? Driver's side. I got it. Okay, it's on there. Okay, okay, I think it looks like it's seated now. So, yes, the foam gasket. Okay, now the axle. All right, and now there's a difference between the passenger and the driver's side axle. Yes. The passenger side has the adjusting ring, and, and right now we're building the driver's side which doesn't have the adjusting ring. So very carefully slip it through the seal. Don't let a lot of axle weight on the seal so you don't tear the seal. Okay. Kind of support it while you slide it through there. Keep, keep it supported, slide it through there carefully. There you go, perfect. Tilt it up a little bit to get it into the splines. There you go, there you go, great. There it is, it's in the spline. Get it over the studs, perfect. All right, now we can put all five nuts on this side. You know, I'm, I'm having to try to be hands off in this and Alyssa's doing all the hands on and I'm having a really hard time staying out of it, but I'm, I'm trying to coach her through. I'm just really impressed with what a good job she's doing. There you go, should be set at 35. Remember how to use the torque wrench? Yeah, it's tricky. Start pulling until it starts showing a bunch of uh, colors. It'll go from yellow to red to green or something like that. <laughs> That's it, 35. Okay. You know, this is a lot better when you actually uh, get to work and not have to watch the whole time. It's a lot more fun. I agree. I'm gonna have to learn some jokes. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> We are working on an Alpine White 1970 Roadrunner. Uh, I do like the car because it's a kind of a crunch project to get it done. I like it because I have not worked on it enough yet to dislike it. And I haven't sprayed this color yet. 
So I got two things going for me. Now, when the car's done, ask me again if I like the car. One thing I truly, honest to God, I don't like is anybody waiting on me. So I'll do the best that I can, work weekends, I got the guys coming in with me to make up as much time as we can. The good thing is we will make up time. I won't be able to make up five days because the primer still has to dry, and the end result, the car has, still has to look perfect, whether I did it in a month or whether I did it in a week. So we're gonna pick up as much slack as we can, but when you have everybody off in every department, ultimately it falls on assembly. The 1970 Chrysler, her 300H, it is a very rare car. They built 501 of them. What feature on this car came only on this model car and wasn't available on any other Mopar muscle car? Was it fiberglass hood, fiberglass trunk lid, rear spoiler? If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. We'll find out. Well, you'll find out. I already know the answer. You know, Warman is a pretty unique individual. Single-handedly built his business, had a successful TV show. Could have had one myself, chose not to. <laughs> Nothing more than a ninth grade education, some hard work. <laughs> Folks, I know why we're all here. Yeah, because my dad is insane. Now, honey, that's not official yet. Ugh, ugh. That punk pulled a Glock 7 on me. Do you know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up on your x-ray machines, and it costs more than you make in a month, pal. You'd be surprised what I make in a month. <laughs> no, my simple-minded friends. Mark has gathered us here to solve the mystery of who tried to have him killed. <laughs> tried? What do you mean, tried? What oh the God. hell? What is this? What's going on? What is going on? No, 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 People, people, let's focus here. As you all know, last season an attempt was made on my life. And the perpetrator is sitting at this very table as we speak. Dad, you've gone too far. It was an animation. Just something to get people talking during the off season. In fact, it was your idea. Now wait just one minute. Are you suggesting that I tried to commit suicide? I'm leaving, this is stupid. Yeah, I'm leaving too. Let's get out of here, Stan. I'm hungry anyway. Nobody is leaving. Let's make one thing perfectly clear. You have all been invited to dinner and a murder. Nobody is leaving here until we figure out who tried to take me out or somebody dies. yippee ki -yay. All right, guys, how did we do on that one? Now, this was a little bit of a trick question, which is okay, I like to do that. What feature on the 300H was only available on the 300H and no other Mopar muscle car? If you guessed trunk lid, you're right. Fiberglass trunk lid came standard on this, as did the fiberglass hood. The tricky part is, this particular car, the rear spoiler is built into the fiberglass trunk lid. So if you guessed spoiler, technically you're right because it's part of the deck lid. A little something, something there for you. <laughs> Sounded good. There we go. Let's put on the retainers. 
containing clips. I love working with Doug. He's always so much fun. He's so smart. That's the thing is that like, you don't expect him to have so much knowledge because he's so quiet, but he really does. And I always end up learning so much with him. Okay. Nice. So we got our brakes done. Brake lines are on. Are we uh, not missing? Are we missing any brake lines? We are. Well, what happened? We put some on. We don't have them. Oh, how come? Do you have any in inventory? Huh? Wait, don't we keep those down here? No, they're upstairs mm. in the parts room. Where in the parts room? Well, who takes care of the parts room? Who's supposed to make requests for parts if they need something? Mark? Me? Or whoever me? needs it. Well, then just let me know and I can get you some. OK, can you get me some? Sure, probably not today. But Why not? this is soon because. OK, I need some. OK. Park brake well, cables it's not an for instant us. thing. It's not McDonald's. So you don't just like Have it my pull way. up, place your order, and pull up to the next one and get it. That's not the way it works around here. I wish. But OK, well, I'll get those coming, and then we can finish it. But other than that, we're done, right? Yep. That was pretty fun. Yeah. Thanks for working with me. Thank you, Alyssa. That was a blast. Thank you. You can so build a couple rear ends out every day if need be. I can do four or five. See? Easy, if I had all the parts. See so. what you did there. Because the car is going alpine white, it's a solid color. We can panel paint the whole thing. It's very easy, nothing hard to do whatsoever. So we do save a lot of time, the fact that it is just white. If it was a metallic, then we're painting the car as one because the metallic has to match. You can get away with panel painting the car, meaning do it at, in different stages, paint a door and a fender here, paint something else here. So it's a very easy color and that does save quite a bit of time for us. I do have to do a black stripe on the car, but I can't do that until the car is assembled, meaning doors, fenders, hood. Once we've made sure that that looks perfect, Mark signed off on the gaps, we'll roll the car back over, I'll mask off the hood and cowl, and then do the stripe on it. And it's a flat black, so it'll break up the white nice. Cindy D'Agostino's beautiful little 1970 Dodge Challenger 440 Magnum Automatic Air Conditioning, plum crazy white top, white side stripe, beautiful car. We just got the Craigers in for this. He wanted these special Craigers, so we called up, we got them ordered. They showed up eight seconds ago, and somehow he has radar. So I just got, before we even went on set, I got a text from him saying, how do they look? They look fine. He wants them mounted and balanced and put on the car so we can get that big surprise look so he can score points with his wife, I guess. I don't know what it is. All I know is I got him breathing down my neck on that car. So our 70 Roadrunner, we're doing very well on it. This car's already been out, been disassembled, dipped, came back. We replaced the minimal amount of metal on the car. So all the paint work is done. The sub assemblies that are going into the car are done. The engine, the transmission are all built out and ready to go into the car. So we're actually, in the in the calendar of things, I would guess that we're maybe two days ahead of-ish uh, of where we'd like to be, which is great. Because I mean, two days is like an eternity when it comes to working on when it comes to working on these cars, that's nice. You keep rolling, I want them to see. Grip boy, you, yeah. When you plug that many lights into one outlet, Clark, Griswold, you're gonna blow a breaker. 